Stephen Benner, Distinguished Fellow, Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, Gainesville, Florida. Pamela Conrad, astrobiologist, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland. And joining us via phone from Tempe, Arizona, James Elser, professor, Arizona State University. And with that, I turn it over to Mary. Thank you all for joining us today. Today's report is going to be on a life from Earth that was discovered that does something very unusual. It is terrestrial life, but not life as we know it. This research was funded by the Astrobiology Program, which is a research and analysis program in NASA that focuses on the origin and evolution of life, the distribution of life, and the future of life on Earth to inform us as to how we might search for life or evidence of life in other places in our solar system and beyond. <clears throat> NASA has had a long history of funding origin of life research. In fact, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And the research that's going to be presented here today ex exemplifies the goals of our program and our interest in the origin of life and life in the universe. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Felisa Wolf-Simon, the lead author on the paper, to fill us in on what she did and what she found. Thanks, Mary. Well, as Mary can probably knows, and as many of my colleagues would agree with, I'm always interested in exceptions to the rule. And what I'm going to talk about here today is not that much different than another exception to the rule. And so I've discovered, I've, I've led a team that has discovered something that I've been thinking about for many years. And I've been thinking about an idea of substitutions. And what does it mean to be substitution? And what does it mean to be toxic? So I've led a team that has discovered a microbe that can substitute arsenic for phosphorus in its major biomolecules. But let me step back for a minute. All life that we know of requires carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And it uses those six elements in some of the critical pieces I think we're all familiar with, including DNA and RNA, or the, the information technology of the cell, the proteins, which are the molecular machines, and the lipids, which separates you from everything else. And so by discovering, we've discovered an our organism that can substitute one element for another in these major biomolecules. So I want to put that in the context of the who, what, where, and how we did this, and, and give us a little bit about, in an astrobiological context, or life in a planetary context, of what this could mean to us on practical and also a bit more esoteric levels. I'd like to introduce to you today the bacterium GFAJ-1. These are not little potatoes. They are a microbe that scientists lovingly call little bugs, but they're not bugs, uh, they're microbes. And this is a bacterium that although looks ordinary, and this may look like a, a type of micrograph many of us may have seen in different places, but it's doing something extraordinary. And so we'll talk about that. But first, let's find out where this microbe is from. Here we're looking at a map of Mono Lake, California. It's in Northern California and east of the Sierras just outside of Yosemite National Park. It's a very interesting environment, and we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. If we could please roll that footage. Mono Lake is three times the salt of seawater, a peach of 10. It's basic, like bleach. And it's, it's got very high levels of arsenic. And it's teeming with life. So the seemingly inhospitable environment teems with life, like bacteria and algae and brine shrimp, and is a major stopping point for migratory birds on their, on their way through the United States. And we went to look for an interesting microbe, and we went to an unusual place. So let me tell you a little bit about how, how we did this. So if you want to look for an organism that can substitute one element for another, uh, you might want to think about where that, or, where that particular element is abundant. And Mono Lake is abundant in arsenic. But why would I come up with the idea of substituting arsenic for phosphorus? If we think about the periodic table, arsenic lies just below phosphorus on the periodic table. And, and so they actually have a, the physical size of arsenic and phosphorus are very similar. We call it the atomic radii, but it's the physical size of the atom, as far as we can tell, is very, very similar. And actually, the fact of this chemical similarity, and there's other, other things I'd be happy to discuss at length with, uh, with folks, but that chemical similarity lends insight into something that arsenic is toxic because it looks like phosphorus. So your cells and my cells and microbial cells, they can't tell the difference. And that's, that's very interesting to me as a biochemist. So, 
I went to an environment to look for this particular microbe, and what we did, we took the muds of Mono Lake that we just were introduced to, and we, we wanted to see if anything would grow. If we took that mud and we gave it a, a laboratory environment that was rich in everything else it needed, sugar, vitamins, not, not that bad for us, and we, we added no phosphorus and added very high doses of arsenic. It was a double whammy, you could think of it. This is not an experiment that most people might run. But it was driven by my question, is there a microbe on Earth that could substitute arsenic for phosphorus in its basic biomolecular uh, constituents? And so what did we find? We found that not only did this microbe cope or deal with the toxicity, we might say, with, with arsenic, but it grew and it thrived. And that was amazing. Nothing should have grown. Put your plant in the dark. It doesn't grow. So something grew. Now we wanted to find out what was happening. So we measured the insides of the cells. We took the cells and we measured the total arsenic concentration inside the cells. It was taking up this arsenic. That's unusual. And then we found that the arsenic was associated specifically with a band of genomic DNA. And so we isolated the genomic DNA. I think a lot of us have heard this kind of thing. We measured that there was arsenic there. And then we could tell that the arsenic wasn't just stuck. It was in a, a, an analogous type of chemical environment, or its nearest neighbors looked like it was behaving like phosphorus. So it was associated. It was inside the cell. It was somehow associated with the DNA, and it had this chemical environment, or it, it had an analogous sort of, sort of, it's like sitting at a dinner table, and you and your neighbors, and how we might see that you were all around. Well, what should be in the place of phosphorus looked like it was arsenic. We measured it as arsenic. And so let's look at a, an artist's rendition of, of what we think is going on in the cell. Let's, let's roll that animation, please. So here we're seeing the beautiful, elegant structure of the double helix of DNA. And what I want to highlight is the phosphate backbone, we say, and that's the light orange balls. And it stitches together as we see the edges of DNA. It holds together the DNA, the backbone. And so what we think is happening, what our, our, all the evidence we've collected suggests, is that instead of these, we'll see these, these orange, light orange balls disappear. And represented by green balls, we see that arsenic would be substituting for phosphorus in the backbone of DNA. And you can see how critical this component of the DNA might be. So what I've presented to you today is a microbe doing something different than life as we knew it. I was taught as a biochemist that all life on Earth, all life we know of, to hearken back to the pale blue dot ideas of Carl Sagan, all life we know of is here so far. And if there's an organism on Earth doing something different, We've cracked open the door to what's possible for life elsewhere in the universe. And that's profound, and to understand how life is formed and where life is going. This microbe substitutes arsenic for phosphorus in its basic biomolecules. And what else might we find? What else might we want to look for? Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Felisa. It's very exciting, of course. And we have several other people up here uh, and joining us from Arizona. Uh, the next person who will be speaking is Dr. James Elzer. He's a professor of ecology, evolution, and ev environmental sciences in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State, joining us from Tempe. Uh, his background is in ecology, and he's going to put into context the importance of phosphorus and, and why this sub substitution of this is, is of interest. Jim? Hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, sunny Tempe. It's a very exciting day. Um, congratulations to Felisa and her team on this uh, really uh, stimulating uh, report that's coming out. And, and uh, someone who's studied phosphorus for a long time, it's really quite surprising that we're having this discussion. So what I want to do for everyone, though, is try to place phosphorus in the context of ecology and the environment and evolution and how important it is for uh, human beings and in in the operation of our society. So if I could just bring up the first... Um, the first slide there. So what we know from a lot of studies in ecology is that phosphorus is all, often limiting to the growth of all kinds of organisms, bacteria, algae, higher plants, even uh, higher animals. 
themselves. And this uh, picture from the Tennessee Valley Authority shows quite clearly that phosphate added on the right-hand side of the picture is limiting also to crop plants. And so we add a lot of phosphorus in fertilizer. And in fact, phosphorus-based fertilizers are one of the, 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 the pillars of the green revolution. So phosphorus is limiting in a lot of different ecosystems, and it's limiting for the reasons that Felisa described, because life as we know it, organisms that we know around us rely on phosphorus to build nucleic acids and other molecules that they need to grow and proliferate. So uh, phosphorus is well known to be extremely important for all kinds of organisms and ecological systems. So if we go on to the next one, uh, because phosphorus is limiting and everything needs it, it often uh, turns out also that when phosphorus leaks out of systems, like out of agricultural fields or out of cities or such, it functions as a pollutant. And here you can see a lake on the bottom half has received phosphorus. Um, the top side has only received carbon and nitrogen. The bottom side has received carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So phosphorus is necessary to have massive algal blooms that lead to the greening of lakes like this and eutrophication. So phosphorus is a big issue for sustainability uh, and aquatic, uh, the, the quality of aquatic ecosystems. So we know that phosphorus, because it's limiting, because it's so important to organisms, often functions as a pollutant when it leaves uh, human, uh, human hands. Now if we go on to the next uh, slide, we can also start to talk about, well, where does this phosphorus come from that we use in fertilizer? Well, it comes from just a few places around Earth. It comes from mines of phosphorite deposits that were built up over tens of and hundreds of millions of years by biological processes. These mines are located in just a few countries around the world. The American, uh, the United States has phosphorus reserves in Florida and North Carolina that are rapidly being uh, depleted because of fertilizer consumption. Morocco has major phosphorus reserves, as does China, but the, the distribution of this resource is relatively scarce around our planet. And so because of this scarcity and its geographic distribution, and because of the burgeoning demand for phosphorus fertilizer, there's some concern, if we can see the next slide, please, um, uh, among scientists that the uh, supplies of, fer of phosphorus that support the green revolution and high agricultural production might be become scarce, at least supplies of cheap phosphorus. And so we need to get a lot cleverer about phosphorus in society, and it's really exciting to think about the possibilities that are raised by the, a clever organism that has evolved a way to do without phosphorus, possibly, as we're talking about uh, today. So if we go on to the next slide. So as I think about the... Uh, the ramifications for the possibility of an organism that doesn't use phosphorus, the, the possibilities start to run away uh, to think about how it might be used in wastewater treatment, how it might be used in recovering phosphorus um, from various sources, how it might be used in bioenergy production, and other sorts of uh, possibilities. So really, uh, the, we have a new way of thinking now if this, uh, is, if this study holds up, that there are organisms that are possibly able to grow without phosphorus. And as someone who studied phosphorus for my entire uh, career, essentially, and who regularly gives lectures about phosphorus in which I state that every living thing uses phosphorus to build its DNA, uh, the idea that I'm sitting here today discussing the possibility that that's not true is quite shocking. So, Felisa, I have to thank you and blame you for making uh, our lives uh, somewhat uh, uh, more difficult. So it really is quite a remarkable um, report in the context of, how, of what we know about phosphorus uh, and its importance in ecosystems. So thank you, Jim. It sounds to me like you're going to need to go out and find a new textbook to teach all those students about uh, what, build, what elements are used to build life. Well, I don't know about a whole new textbook, but certainly some paragraphs and sentences are going to have to be uh, rewritten as of today. Give me some time, Jim. I'm, I'm at the beginning of my career, so uh, see you on the back end of that. Okay, Felice. I'll, I'll be you. happy to review it. I'll, I'll, I'll get started. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen Benner, um, from the uh, founder and distinguished fellow from the Foundation of Applied Molecular Evolution. And he's spent a lot of his life uh, uh, as an organic chemist and, uh, and studying the chemistry of life. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm the curmudgeon here. I'm the chemist who has been brought in, as Felisa knows, to throw wet blankets on things and to try to damp a little bit the enthusiasm. Um, my next three minutes will be successful if I convey to you folks 
uh, why chemists think that this is an exceptional result and why, therefore, chemists will, like Carl Sagan said,